Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are going to be going over the brief history and geography of Jordan. We'll do geography first. It'll be kind of quick this time. And then we'll go over its history and then we'll flip through this book. So Jordan is located um, in like the Near East, not quite the Middle East. Um, it is bordered by Syria up here, by Israel, and the West Bank area down here. Um, it's down here is Saudi Arabia, and right here is Iraq. Um, so it's almost landlocked. It has a little, I'm trying to move this, a little tiny coastline right here, the Gulf of Aqaba. And it has the major port city right there of Aqaba. The Gulf of Aqaba leads out to the Red Sea. But by far the most famous body of water in Jordan would be the Dead Sea. It is the lowest point on earth. As you can see, I didn't talk about it in my Israel video because the border of Israel and Jordan cuts right through the Dead Sea. So this half is Jordan, this half is claimed by Israel. And there's also the Jordan River where the country gets its name from makes up the border of Jordan and Israel right here. It is Jordan's longest river. Um, Jordan, for the most part, has some very distinct um, geographic zones. So, um, this area all appears considered the highlands, bordering the, the water here. Um, this is where the fertile farmland is. Um, I think it's, what was it? It was only like 3% of Jordan's land is arable. They have a very tiny farmland. They're one of the most, um, uh, what was the term? It was like, um, one of the countries with the least amount of just water available, um, because really their only fresh water comes from the rivers here. Um, and in this territory is where the majority of the population lives. We have the capital city here of Amman. Um, also, large cities would be Irbid up here. Of course, there's a Kaaba down there. Um, while we're over here, by far the most famous part of Jordan would be Petra. You can see right there and right here. One of the most amazing sites in the world. Easily the biggest tourist attraction in Jordan next to like the Dead Sea and everything. Um, we'll obviously talk about it in its history, but it is by far the most photographed and visited spot in Jordan from tourists. I mean, it's even on the cover of this book here. It's a beautiful little ruin, so we'll talk about that in a minute, if you've never heard of it before. Um, let's see, we also have um, <laughs> this zone over here of the Syria Desert. It is desert desert. It's pretty barren not a lot of water, actually pretty much no water really. Um, and it's, it's pretty barren. I mean, you see these strangely shaped borders here and, um, obviously it's because of its history because, um, the land was divvied up, but they are such straight prominent lines because there is nothing there. There is no like landmark to determine like this half is Syria, this half is Jordan. It's literally nothing. There are some parts of the Jordan territory, I think around Iraq and Saudi Arabia, where there are actually like lines in the ground determining their borders. Um, but like around here in the desert areas, there is nothing there. Like literally it's desert, desert, abandoned desert. <laughs> so, um, the border is just kind of there. Like, um, if you were actually somehow, unfortunately, walking in this area, you would never know when you'd cross from Syria to Jordan. It's just kind of like a hypothetical border in a way. Um, but that's what I was always curious about with Jordan, is why it was such an odd shape. And of course it has to do with, um, other countries taking over and imposing boundaries. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much like the the major geographic areas of Jordan. Um, lots of um, big cliffs down here. It gets fairly mountainous in places, and even up here you, we get snow sometimes. 
but um, for the most part, um, very hot, very deserty. Um, so let's get into its history. Being in the corner of the globe where, <laughs> you know, human civilization was born, um, the oldest sign of any kind of hominid habitation or sign of life um, is about 200,000 years old. Jordan actually has the, um, the, what is it like? The, it's hard to describe. Like the oldest evidence of bread making was discovered in here. Um, those, um, archaeological sites are from 14,500 years ago. And some of the oldest human statues in the world were discovered in what is now Jordan. They're from 7250 BCE. There's some pictures in here of these statues. They are really creepy looking. They've got like big bug eyes. They're really kind of scary, but interesting nonetheless. This territory for a minute was conquered by the Egyptians, but after the dust settled and all of that, um, there were three distinct kingdoms in this area in its ancient times. Up here-ish we had, there's a map in here of all these kingdoms. Around here, we had the kingdom of Amman, which obviously is where that city gets its name from. Um, around here or so, we had Moab, and down here in the south, we had Edom. And the, the three main kingdoms of the time. Um, you know most about them because of Moab, actually. They left a lot of spells and... Um, descriptions of what their life was like and their conflicts with the Israelites as well. Um, but eventually, those territories were conquered by the Persians, um, which was eventually conquered by Alexander the Great, which, um, after his death, his, I mean, I'm going over this briefly because I've, I've covered a lot of countries in this area, so it's they all have the same story. They were all taken over by the Persians. Alexander the Great took over Persia. And then he died not long after that. And the land that he conquered got divvied up between his generals. So um, he had also conquered Egypt. So he had the Ptolemies down here who were ready to take some land. But there was also the Seleucids up here, right? The Seleucids, yeah, the Seleucids, um, who wound up gaining a lot of territory up here. Syria-ish. Um, but they were in a massive conflict over who should control the territory. So in the meantime, in the south, a different kingdom popped up called the Nabataeans. And they um, flourished by charging a toll for the trade routes that crossed through here. And um, they, they were pretty successful for their time. They're the ones that built Petra, their capital city. This famous site here is a tomb for one of their kings, and you um, can very clearly tell that they had a lot of influence from the Greeks. You can see the columns here, the archways. Um, Greek influence really swept through the territory here during its heyday. But it was the Romans that would eventually conquer. They conquered this area in 63 BCE and they annexed Nabatea in 106 CE. And um, the, the Roman lifestyle really kind of flourished, particularly um, up here. Um, there's still standing today in Amman a Roman theater. And here in Madaba, Madaba um, it has some of the best preserved Roman ruins in the world. It's really beautiful. I believe there's, yeah, there's a nice picture in here of those ruins. Really beautiful. Um, and like I've said, for every country I've done in my series that the Romans took over, the empire eventually split into to a western half and an eastern half. So this territory wound up being controlled by the eastern half, otherwise known as the Byzantine Empire. And um, as like the, the number one fact that every story knows about the Byzantine Empire was that they um, legalized and adopted Christianity and it's here in Jordan it's in Akaba actually that was um, the first purposefully built Christian church was built down here I think that's really cool um, eventually the Byzantine territory was taken over by Arabs in 636 
and I believe I covered this in my Iran video. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Iran because um, this territory was under the control of many different um, like dynasties, um, caliphates that uh, rose to prominence and then were taken over and those rose to prominence and those were taken over. So just briefly, the Umayyads were in control and then the Abbasids and then the Fatimids, right? just glossing over that whole big chunk of history. Basically, um, Islamic culture moves in. So, um, there are still many Christians in the area, but Jordan today is very predominantly Islamic. And that's all due to that influence coming in at the time. Then the Crusades happen. So, over in Europe, the um, European leaders over there were very concerned about the Islamic influence taking over their holy land, so they came in and conquered and took over the city of Jerusalem. Um, they also built um, quite a few castles in the area, so did the Umayyads actually. They built a lot of desert castles um, that were like summer houses, basically. Um, and they had control, the Crusaders, blah, sorry, the Crusaders had control over the territory by 1115. They were beaten back by Saladin in 1187. I have a whole video on him, really interesting figure in history that isn't talked about as much as I think he should be. Saladin was the head of the Ayyubid dynasty, so then this area was controlled by the Ayyubids. And then the Mamluk dynasty came in and took over. And then the people that took over the Mamluks were the Ottomans. They came in 1516. And the Ottoman Empire at that point was growing exponentially. It was huge. Um, I mean, massive, massive. Um, so this territory was kind of neglected by the Ottomans. Not kind of. I hate how I say that. The, the Ottomans absolutely neglected this territory. Um, I mean, they were focused on more bigger issues, but the, the land here kind of fell to anarchy um, and it's extremist Islamic group was taking over at some parts. There was the a son of Amir in Egypt named Ibrahim Pasha who just woke up and chose violence and he decided to take over this territory one day. So he just like left and um, took over this territory in 1818. He was eventually booted out after there was a huge peasant revolt against him and um, he tried to wage war against the Ottomans and failed miserably. So he went back to Egypt with his tail between his legs. Um, so the Ottomans started paying attention to this territory all of a sudden and um, realized that they could, um, you know, do some things with this area. And the biggest thing that they did was they built the Hejaz Railway in 1908. And it was a big railway that cut right through Jordan and it connected Mecca to Istanbul. So perfect for pilgrims. So Amman and all the cities down here became little stopping points on the railway and they really started to rise to prominence. Um, but that um, rise actually led to a very famous revolt. So World War I breaks out, right? The Ottomans are fighting against the, the British. <laughs> let's just leave it at that. There's a lot more to it, but in this scenario, let's say it's Ottomans versus British. Um, there is a royal family down in Saudi Arabia who's in control of Mecca called the Hashemites. And they realize that they can um, take over the territory and basically liberate it from the Ottomans. And the British were very invested in that. And this is the story of Lawrence of Arabia. That's where we get T.E. Lawrence, that that famous movie, Lawrence of Arabia. This is where he is involved and came in and helped um, the Arabs in the region fight back against the Ottomans and reclaim their territory that they had lost hundreds of years ago. So the 1916 Arab revolt was led by um, Sharif Hussein. He, you know, got the allies on his side and all the locals on his side. He came up from Mecca and took over the territory all the way up to Damascus up here and kicked out the Ottomans. Now after the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the French and British divvied up the Ottoman territory, which is how we get some of these lines that you see. 
and um, the British wanted control of this area, but they were going to let the uh, Amir who took over have the control. Um, so the, the Hashemites came into control here in um, what the British were calling Transjordan. Transjordan means like on the other side of the Jordan. So there's the Jordan River. This side is the Transjordan, right? So um, the, the British had control. Um, it was a British mandate uh, of Transjordan, but it was the Hashemites who were in control. Um, it remained a British mandate until 1948, sorry, 1946, um, and in that year, on May 25th, they won their independence, became the Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan, then in May 1948, there's 1948, um, when the state of Israel was declared, um, Jordan joined in with a lot of allies to fight back against Israel in the Arab-Israeli war. Um, and I do talk way more in depth about that in my Israel video. I won't get into it here because it's one of those where um, the country where the war is fought deserves to have that story told. So check out my video on Israel if you want to know more about the details of these wars I'm going to mention. Um, but at the end of the day, Jordan wound up taking over this territory of the West Bank, it's called. And it controlled half of Jerusalem and all of this territory here where the Palestinians were living and trying to stop the spread of Jewish culture and influence and immigration. So um, Jordan changed its name from Transjordan to Jordan because it was no longer on the other side of the River Jordan. They were on this side now, so there was no point in calling it Transjordan, they just called it Jordan. So it became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which it's still called to this day. Many countries in the territory were very aggressive toward Israel. Jordan also was, but they were like the least aggressive of the aggressive countries. Um, they really wanted to help out, um, you know, the Palestinian state as well as the Jewish state. They just wanted to resolve any kind of conflict here. They said they were temporarily holding on to the West Bank until things could be resolved. King Abdullah was um, really vocal about his, you know, that, that stance basically, how you know, everyone should have their own territory, and he was very sadly assassinated um, here in Jerusalem by a Palestinian extremist who did not want him to broker any kind of agreement with the uh, Jews in Israel. Um, so now we have King Hussein. No, sorry, <laughs> I forgot. Um, his son was named Talal, and he became king, but he abdicated not long after he took the throne. Um, he was deemed to be very mentally ill, and the parliament essentially forced him to abdicate. And then, um, King Hussein became king in 1953. Um, and his reign was really interesting. Um, in June 1967, we have the Six-Day War against Israel also. Um, and Israel managed to take back the West Bank from Jordan. Um, many, many Palestinians fled across the border to Jordan, which um, there is still a massive Palestinian population in Jordan today. Um, Jordan kind of sort of worked together with the PLO, the big Palestinian movement against Israel, led by Yasser Arafat, um, but they started to clash here in the territory, which led to a civil war known as Black September. Um, eventually, Jordan renounced their claims to the West Bank in 1988, and they brokered a peace treaty with Israel in 1994, which still holds strong to this day. In 1999, King Hussein passed away, and he named his son, who became Abdullah II, as the next king. He really led Jordan into a more modern, economically prosperous age, obviously until the big economic recession in 2008. Um, in 2003, when the United States started attacking Iraq, many Iraqi refugees fled into Jordan, um, many of which are still there to this day. Um, Jordan's very, very welcoming toward refugees in this area. Um, there was an Al-Qaeda terrorist attack in Amman on November 9th, 2005, um, when three different hotel lobbies were bombed. Um, 
it's, it's just a very sad event, but it was one of those events that led Jordan to be more militant against the terrorist organizations that were prospering in different areas of the Middle East. Um, in 2011, we have the Arab Spring, where many different Arab countries rose up against their um, very horrible rulers. Um, it didn't really happen in Jordan. They had one big day of protest, but that's all it, it really was. There wasn't, I mean, obviously the government didn't like fire on the protesters or anything, so it was just the one day and that was it. Um, it did lead to some reforms, but obviously in other countries in the Middle East, it vastly changed their countries forever. Syria being one of them. You can read or read. You can learn more about that if you check out my Syria video. But um, millions of Syrian refugees poured into Jordan over the years um, after the result of the um, Arab Spring when the government started attacking civilians. Um, and then ISIL managed to worm its way in and start taking over the area. Um, it led to many different refugees, and Jordan has, one, been very accepting of all these Syrian refugees. I think there's like two million in Jordan right now. Um, and they also joined the fight against ISIL in Syria. Um, the, the refugee issue in Jordan, while very, um, commendable, really is a strain on the country because all of a sudden we have all of these people pouring in, um, and... Jordan gladly accepts them, but there isn't really a lot of space for them. They, there isn't really a lot of water for them. Um, it's, it's one of the big major issues that Jordan's facing today. But there is an even bigger one that happened just a few weeks before I'm filming this. In April 2021, there was a big um, sweep of arrests of three major um, political players. Um, one of them was the king's half-brother, Prince Hamza, who apparently had been leading a plot to overthrow the king and therefore overthrow the government. Um, his mother, Queen Noor, who is um, beloved by most in the world, um, says it's all just a huge misunderstanding. As of right now, King Hamza's under house arrest and he doesn't have a phone or the internet or anything. He's been denied all of it. Um, it's interesting to see how that all plays out because um, uh, King Hussein had four different wives so um, King Abdul II is his first child from his second marriage Prince Hamza is his first child from his fourth marriage to Queen Noor um, so they he has a very large family um, the king has a lot of siblings and half siblings um, so it's a it's a big kind of convoluted family mess right at the moment so we'll see how that plays out in the future keep your eye on that but let's flip through the book and look at some pictures of Jordan this is always my favorite part because I love to show you the pictures here we have a beautiful beautiful picture of Petra look at these camels the tourists here and then, of course, this magnificent rock sculpture. This place is on my bucket list, for sure. Always has been. Someday, it'll happen. This chapter goes into detail about how King Abdullah II was appointed the king, because he wasn't originally the crown prince. Part of the big major tea right now is that Prince Hamza was the crown prince. He was the next in line for the longest time, and then um, Abdullah II named his son the next, uh, the crown prince, so that's part of the big issue. <laughs> Here we can see a political map of Jordan. You can see, um, you know, some of the, you can see Petra right there, some of the nature reserves, and all of the major cities here, and where it's located in the world. Here is King Hussein with then Prince Abdullah. Oh yeah, and it does say here how they I can actually trace their lineage back to the Prophet Muhammad. That's fascinating to me. Here is King Hussein's funeral procession. And here is some desert land. This is called the Wadi Rum. And um, there's a picture later in the book, but this landscape um, was used for the movie The Martian to look like Mars. 
it's basically the same kind of landscape almost. Very barren and vast. Here we can see a geographic map of Jordan. There's the Wadi Rum that I mentioned just now. Oh, I didn't mention their highest point. It's Umm Dami right here on the border of Jordan, Saudi Arabia. And you can see the more mountainy area here, and this is all desert. Here are some of the rare farmlands in Jordan. Here's a picture of some wind. This is the Kamsi wind. There we go, that covers everything in dust. Big dust storm. Here we can see the River Jordan making the border between Jordan and Israel. Let's see, this is Irbid over here with some busy cars. Up here we have Zarka, which is right here, sorry. <laughs> Zarka, Azaka. And there's a lady floating on the Dead Sea. That's another thing that I really want to do someday. It looks like a lot of fun. Here's T.E. Lawrence, who fought alongside the Arabs during the Arab Revolt of 1916. This area is known as Lawrence's Spring. And here's Aqaba, the beach, lots of boats and ships. Very beautiful. And palm trees. Gorgeous. This is near the Dead Sea. Oops, sorry. Um, where, like I said, it is the lowest point on Earth, and um, parts around it are creating sinkholes and kind of crashing down, and um, is very detrimental to drinking water in the area, so it's something to look out for. Some of the landscape, rocky, dry. This is the black iris, the national flower of Jordan. Some big cliffs. Hyraxes, aren't they cute? And there's a guy riding a camel. Camels in Jordan are dromedaries. One hump. This is the Arabian oryx. The national animal, right? I believe so. Yep, Jordan's national animal. Which almost went extinct. And, um, I know Jordan, I think Israel as well, did some breeding programs to keep them alive. Some of the coral reef life down in the sea, and these are hoopos, hopos, hopos, I believe. I, I don't know. We don't have those birds here where I live. Before we look at those cute animals, this is the Donna Nature Reserve. Isn't that gorgeous? Like a mini Grand Canyon almost. And this is Princess Aaliyah, daughter of King Hussein. Um, who founded this wildlife reserve to help out these poor little creatures, little babies. So this is Jirash. As you can see, very gorgeous ruins. Amazing, isn't it? All the tourists. I'd like to see that too. Here's the statues, okay? Are you ready for this? Pull, 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 pull. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, are you staring into your soup? Okay, stop. That's so creepy. Why did they paint their eyes? Look at his tiny little mouth. Oh, it's... I feel like it's one of those things that, you know, like if this was an episode of Ancient Aliens, which I abhor, by the way, they would be like, oh, this is a, this is a gray, you know, it's a depiction of an alien. Because <laughs> it just looks so... It looks so creepy. It looks human, but not. But anyway, one of the oldest statues of a human ever created. Why did they paint the eyes? I don't know. We'll never know. So here's a map of the ancient kingdom. So here we can see Amman, Moab, and Edom. Along with Aram that I mentioned in the Siri video. And of course, Israel and Judah that I mentioned in my Israel the Phoenicians and the Philistines as well. And here's the modern day Jordan. Another gorgeous picture of Petra, just to kind of give you a sense of scale with how how did they make it so beautiful out of the 
rock. How long did that take? I wonder. I, I have to go someday. I just have to. Um, mosaics were a big art form in the kind of ancient times. This is a really cool one of a, it looks like a dog, yep, a dog chasing a bunny. And this is the really famous one. Um, this is actually a huge mosaic and it turns out to be a map of like the whole territory. It says this here is Jerusalem and it says in Greek all the different places. You can see the, the water up here. How cool is that? A map showing the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Here's modern day Jordan and how they started off here and here and then grew out. It's a massive empire. Here's an old picture of the Hejaz Railway which That'd be kind of cool to travel down around these big cliffs. And here's a map of the Arab Revolt. Um, so you can see how they traveled and battled, battled, battled all the way and met up with the British here and had a big fight in Damascus where they eventually won out. Here's a picture from the Arab-Israeli War, all their tanks. We have a Palestinian refugee camp in 1949. And here is King Hussein in his younger years. And here is Queen Noor and Queen Rania. So Queen Noor, as I said, was King Hussein's fourth wife. Um, and Queen Rania is King Abdullah II's wife. And this isn't a great picture of her, but she's like, personally, a personal opinion here. One of like the most beautiful people alive today. She is so gorgeous. This was the peace agreement between Jordan and Israel, and there's Bill Clinton overseeing it in the United States. This is interesting, look. So this is a military band playing the bagpipes, because I didn't know this before reading this book, that bagpipes actually originate from the Middle East. They're so associated with Scotland, you wouldn't think of it as Middle Eastern, but here we are. That's so interesting. We have, oh, this is from the um, 2011 Arab Spring protest. The Day of Rage, they called it. There's King Abdullah II. I'm not looking very happy in that picture. Here's a beautiful picture of Oman in the evening. And a map of, like, the main city center. There's a big hill right here called the Citadel, where there is some ancient ruins, like the Temple of Hercules. There's the Roman theater. And then, of course, the famous museums and the royal court palace. Here are the, the legislators here. And this is a politician named Wafabani Mustafa, who um, has helped to pass a lot of laws for women's rights. This lady is showing off that she just voted. They um, dip their fingers in ink after. So instead of getting a cool sticker like we do here in America, they dye your finger. It says, these are supporters of the Islamic Action Front, the largest opposition party in the Chamber of Deputies. This is the military helping out Syrian refugees. And over here we have the little box about the flag. So it says, the elements of the flag of Jordan honor several different periods and events in the nation's past. The flag features three horizontal bands, top one is black, the middle band is white, and the bottom one is green. These bands symbolize three historic dynasties of Arab rulers, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, and the Fatimids. On the flag's left side is a red triangle that overlaps the horizontal bands. It represents the Hashemite family. Hashemite kings have ruled Jordan since 1921. In the middle of the triangle is a seven-pointed white star. It honors Islam, the official religion of Jordan. The seven points stand for the first seven verses in the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam. Adopted in 1922, the design and colors of Jordan's flag were inspired by banners waved during the Arab Revolt. Modern Jordan has its roots in this 1916 rebellion, during which Arab armies under Hashemite rule fought for their independence from the Ottoman Empire. That's a neat flag. This guy is selling some beans. Beans and nuts. A 
the map of the resources of Syria. So, um, Syria doesn't have, or Syria, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Jordan. I just saw Syria appear and went with it. Jordan, this video is on Jordan. Jordan doesn't have oil in the way that many other Middle Eastern countries have oil. They have something called oil shales, which is um, a much difficult and not as profitable way to mine oil, but it is something that is of a lot of interest because um, it, it could generate revenue for the country. A picture of their money. It's in art. There's a guy getting a CT scan. Um, Jordan has a fantastic... Um, what you would call it, a health service, like a health industry. Um, some women weaving some blankets, rugs maybe. Um, I have a few videos already on microcredit, and Jordan is one of those countries that provides that for, mainly for the women in rural areas to help establish businesses. This is a refugee camp in northwestern Jordan is a Bedouin women. So, um, when I say that the desert areas, there's like nothing there, there are Bedouin tribes that do live out there. Pretty much the only kind of people that live out there. Here's a population map. You can see what I mean. Everyone pretty much lives around here and right there. These are, okay, so I mentioned this in the video tomorrow, which I've already recorded. But I've always said Circassians, and I believe now I'm saying that wrong. So if you do know, let me know. I think it's like Circas Circassians or something like that. I'm not positive. It's something I need to look more into. Um, but they are people of Islamic descent that came from Russia. Um, as refugees also, technically. Um, they have this very famous dance. <laughs> Let's see. This is so cute, kids. We have a golden school. Over here it says these are Iraqi refugees at the coffee shop. And an example of um, Arabic being the main language of Jordan, but there's also a lot of English signs as well. Some good important instructions about swimming in the Dead Sea. This is the chapter about, but what is Islam, really? Every single place here's the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I talk more about it in my Israel video, but when the Dead Sea Scrolls were, disco were discovered, um, it was when the West Bank was being controlled by Jordan. So technically they were found in Jordan for being extremely technical. Um, but apparently the Jordan Museum does still have some Dead Sea Scrolls and they want Israel to return them. And Israel says, no, it's a whole thing. But if you don't know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were these, um, like parchment papers, which pretty much has the oldest Bible ever written. And they were found in just like some caves near the Dead Sea. And um, they're just really fascinating. And for the longest time, the Israeli government didn't want to reveal what they said. So that like a lot of conspiracies went around, but then they finally put out like, there's like a PDF file of everything translated. It's pretty much just a Bible. It's nothing too grand or about aliens or anything. Quran. This man is a Druze, so I've mentioned him, or him, I've mentioned the Druze in my videos on I I Iran, I almost said Iraq, and Syria, uh, how they are a faith that um, diverged from Islam, so they're not Islamic, um, but their belief is um, kept secret, they're a closed religion. This was the King Hussein bin Talal Mosque, the biggest mosque in Jordan, built in memory of King Hussein. Oh gosh, over here is a Ramadan feast, diving in. The, I hate these kind of boat rides that swing up like that. Oh, they make me so sick. I, I feel like that guy when I'm on that kind of ride. I don't do those ever again. No, thank you. An imam giving a sermon. This is Father Nabil Haddad, who is a very prominent Christian priest um, who kind of has a, a big message of like, let's all just get along. Um, this is the Greek Orthodox Church, the majority Christian religion in Jordan. There's a Roman Catholic priest. And here's some beautiful, beautiful jewelry. 
Bedouin jewelry. Isn't that gorgeous? So pretty. Carpets, of course, are a very important craft and industry. This guy is doing some beautiful embroidery. A famous artist named Lujana Lee in front of her paintings and some really neat modern art. <laughs> I like that. Here's a picture of the Roman theater. Some kids climbing up it. It's still in use today. It's still used for outdoor concerts and things like that. And this is Mustafa Wabi al-Tal, arguably the most famous Jordanian poet. Here's a picture of the Martian, filmed in Jordan. And this is actually a Palestinian man who is a refugee living in Jordan. Um, is Ibrahim Nasrallah, and he's a very famous author. We have a man playing the oud, very traditional instrument. This is, I think it's Sate Durrani, who's a musician who tours the world with like peace concerts watching a big football match. This is Ahmad Abu Gaush, who won the first Olympic medal for Jordan in Taekwondo. And these are Dima and Lama. Um, they are twins who do like competitive running. They're some of the fastest women in the world. This guy's pouring some coffee, a big part of Bedouin tradition. <laughs> this is just about Hopscotch. There's Aman looking very busy. <laughs> Isn't that cute? This headscarf's called a kafia. And here's a beautiful wedding. <laughs> he looks happy. Here is salab, which is like a, a warm milk with toppings on it. Sounds really yummy. Now this, oh my gosh, so this is called mansaf. And it looks amazing. I would tear into this. Doesn't this look divine? Oh my gosh. I wonder if there's any restaurants near me that have this, because I would love to try this dish, but it's like a um, celebration dish. It's like how if you traveled abroad and went to an American restaurant, you know, they'd sell like hamburgers and fried chicken. They wouldn't have like Thanksgiving dinner, you know? So I imagine it's like, that's what I mean by a celebration meal. Um, so I don't think it's just something that they would have on like a regular menu, but surely somewhere near here has that. That looks amazing. The little nuts, the rice, oh my gosh, it looks amazing. And there's a course of kebab. Delicious. And here is a crowd celebrating Independence Day. And that's the end of our book tonight. So, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much for watching. I have okay. Thank you so much for watching. I have two other videos coming up this week about Jordan, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. We're going to be um hopping around the globe a little bit because um I'm looking at my calendar. Um I have one country next week that I have one extra book on and then I have like one, two, three, four more countries that I don't have any books on. So they'll just be a little one-off. Um, so subscribe so you don't miss it, because there's four countries coming up that are only going to have one video. You don't want to miss those. There's some good ones in there, believe me. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, good,